During the course of the Easter season, we have been walking through uh, the Acts of the Apostles. The first reading has been continued just to talk about the way that the, the faith spread from the empty tomb to the rest of the world. And this week, we come to another key moment in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, just, if you're, just to remind you, last week, we talked a lot about St. Paul. Um, St. Paul proves to us very, very clearly that anybody can be an evangelist. Anybody can share the faith. Because if you take someone who was a notorious murderer of Christians, who was trying to stamp out this movement of Christianity, you take someone as bold and as, as outright and, and publicly dismissive of the faith, like St. Paul, convert him and have him being able to preach, to teach, to write half of the New Testament, then anybody is qualified to share the faith. So if you find yourself in a spot of, I don't know, Father, that doesn't really apply to me, anybody. And if you knew me in high school, anybody, right? If that's the case, that anybody can share the faith, I think today we finish off this movement by focusing on St. Peter. St. Peter's activity in the Acts of the Apostles today. Because if anybody can share the faith, there's a reason. And that reason is that everyone needs to hear the message. Anyone can share the faith. Why? Because everyone needs to hear the message. Why do I think St. Peter? I I think St. Peter is a great example of everyone needing to hear the message that Jesus Christ died and rose so that you and I can have eternal life. St. Peter is a perfect example of this. First of all, St. Peter falls into that first category a little bit. He's one of those people that he's an anybody. Because quite honestly, St. Peter was an uneducated fisherman who was bad at his job. And the Lord chose him, brought him, clo- brought him into his inner circle, and sent him out to be the first pope. St. Peter is a good example for us, another good example for us, that anybody can do this. I love St. Peter. St. Peter gives me hope. Because quite honestly, me and him got a lot in common. Because he has a tendency to put his foot in his mouth. He has a tendency to kind of jump out ahead and be really excited and then not follow through. He has a tendency to kind of try and hide and protect himself when he's afraid. St. Peter gives us a lot of hope. But St. Peter today steps up to the plate and makes the first convert that's not Jewish. It might not seem like a big deal to us now, 2,000 years later, sitting in Raceland, Louisiana, but I want to break this open for us a little bit. We hear about this mysterious figure that we don't hear about a whole lot in the, in the Scriptures. His name is Cornelius, and he is a centurion. Why does that matter? Well, Cornelius, if he is a centurion, that means that he is an official in the Roman army. That he is a Roman soldier. In fact, he is in charge of a hundred other Roman soldiers. Centurion, century, 100. He's in charge of a hundred other soldiers. So that's his job. He is a commander of other... He is a leader in the Roman, in the Roman military. If you read through the Acts of the Apostles, who is the one group that is doing their best to stamp out the movement of the Christian faith? The Romans. St. Paul was a Roman soldier before he was an apostle. So the Romans are doing their absolute best to try and stamp out this movement. They're brutal, they're notorious, and they stop at no length to make sure that their mission is accomplished. So Peter, today, is at home, sitting around, probably scrolling through Facebook or something, and what happens? A Roman soldier comes to him, not just any, but an official, a military official from the Roman guard, comes to him, tell me about God. Tell me about your God. 
I can only imagine what was going through Peter's mind. I can only imagine that this is the most unlikely person possible that would have come to Peter. And Peter could have easily have said, I'm good. What God? I'm good. Don't know. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not, I'm not going down that thing. He, he has already been arrested. He's been beaten. He's been thrown into prison. Peter has gone through hell and back with the Roman guard. And now one of their officials is coming, knocking on his door and asking him, tell me about your God. And Peter could have easily have just said, no thank you, please leave. Because in the back of his mind, honestly, what could have been going on is Peter could have been walking right into a trap. Tell me about your God. Come on, come walk with me. Let's go for a little walk. And then he disappears. What would motivate Peter to actually evangelize this man? Because quite honestly, if it was me, I would have a really hard time doing it because I would sit back and think, this guy's not worthy of it. Cornelius and your, lead, your followers, fine. You know what? You go do your thing. Go pray to your pagan gods. Go stay over there. Just leave me alone and let me, pray, let me enjoy my faith. It's my faith. You don't need it. Stay over there. Goodbye. But that's not what God established when he established the church. That's not what God desired when he desires the church. So Peter had to risk something. He had to risk his safety. He had to risk his livelihood. He has to risk his health. He has to risk himself of being rejected or beaten or murdered. He had to risk something. Share the faith. Because God asked him to. I have to imagine that Peter did not want to do it. That Peter did not want to go there. But God was pushing him forward. Because our faith is meant to be shared. Our faith is meant to go out. Our faith is not meant just for our own good and our own edification and our own peace. Our faith is meant to be shared. And everyone is qualified to share it. Why? Because everyone needs to hear the message. Everyone is qualified to share it because everyone needs to hear the message. Uh, when I was a seminarian, I was, a, I was at a parish, and I remember I would talk to the pastor at the beginning of the week, and he would basically give me a rundown of what he wanted me to do. He would just give me like a little punch list. You know, go visit these people, plug into this group, go visit this Bible study. I want you to go have lunch with this woman. I want you to go eat, you know, have coffee with her. On like all these, like he would just give me a list of things to do. And I remember one day, one of the things he asked me to do, he said, I want you, there's a guy in our parish, good guy, he's on parole, but he's still in, he's in jail, he's in a work release thing, I want you to go and visit him. Here's the number of the guy you have to talk to, but I want you to go to the jail and I want you to just go sit down and just pray with him, talk with him, let him hear you out. Good dude made a mistake. But I want you to go and visit this man. And I remember on my, on my desk, I had my list of things that I was supposed to do for the week. I had all my stuff listed out. And the last thing on the list was call so-and-so to set up that meeting. And every day I would come in and I would look at it. I don't feel like doing that today. Not today. And I'd go about and do my business. And then the next day I would come in and I would walk in and I'd look at it and I'd, I really don't, I, you know what, not today. I'm too busy. I got, I got other things going on. I, it's fine. I'll, I'll get it to it tomorrow. And then I'd go out and do my thing. Every day that week I came in, I saw the number, I saw the name, and I knew the task that had been handed to me. And every single day I walked into my office, looked at it, and ignored it. So the following week, I have my meeting with the pastor, and him are talking, and he says, he, we're just kind of running through things, and I'm just sitting there hoping he, don't, he ain't going to ask me about that task. It's going to be good. First thing he says, hey, did you go visit so-and-so? No, I didn't. And he asked me, he said, why? I couldn't give him a straight answer. 
I couldn't give him a clean answer. I, I, couldn't, I, like, I hadn't really thought about why I was so hesitant to set up that phone call. But the reason why that I came to later on that me and him talked about was that I didn't want to be uncomfortable. And that was going to be uncomfortable. I didn't want to be uncomfortable. And that meeting, that visit, was going to be uncomfortable. How often do we leave our faith in the church because it's going to be uncomfortable in the world? How often do you and I, and I'm, I'm guilty of it just as well as, as everybody else, how often do we walk out of the church and leave our faith in the pew and we'll pick it up next Sunday when we get back? Or does the faith that we proclaim, the, the, the sacrament that we receive, does it actually have an impact on the rest of our life when we live? I got a feeling St. Peter didn't want to go and talk to Cornelius because it was going to be uncomfortable. There was going to be some risk. But see, God had called it. With Peter's life, God had called it. He knew that Peter was going to be this way. We at the last... Just to give you a little rundown of what do I mean, there's a moment in Scripture that's really, really specific. St. Peter on Good Friday, he denies Jesus three times, and then he runs away. Jesus dies, he rises, we see him, we see Peter at the, at the empty tomb, and he's all excited and freaking out just like everybody else. Whoa, Jesus is gone, but now I see him, and he's resurrected, and this is amazing. Peter finds himself a couple of days later sitting around with some of the disciples, and they're just talking, they're visiting, they're joining. And he says, I'm going fishing. He goes out on the lake. Jesus shows up again walking on water. Peter jumps in, swims to him. They have a nice little fish fry on the beach. It's a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful scene. And there's a moment in there that we hear that Jesus looks at Peter and asks him three times. He said, Peter, do you love me? He says this three times. Now for us, the word love... The word love is translated the same no matter if I say I'm loving pizza, I love my brother, I love my spouse, or I love my God. But the Greek suggests that there's a different meaning behind the word love. So bear with me for a second. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me as a brother? The word's philios. We get Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. He says, Peter, do you love me as a brother? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you as a brother. Jesus then follows up. He says, Peter, do you love me to the point of dying for me? Agape. It's a different word. Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you as a brother. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me as a brother? And then Peter is distressed, and he goes into this little talk, and he says, Lord, you know that I love you as a brother. That, that's all I got right now. Then Jesus says this, and I wanted to read it today because it's a, it's a powerful point. He says, I say to you, when you were young, you fastened your own belt and walked where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand, and another will lead you where you do not wish to go. See, Jesus is, selling, is telling Peter, you're not going to want to lay down your life for me. You are not going to want to do the mission that I have given you. But stay close to me, and I'll lead you there. You're not going to want to do the thing that makes you uncomfortable. You're not going to want to evangelize the Roman soldier that's coming to you. You're not going to want to share your faith and to lead my church. But I'm going to be with you. My Holy Spirit is going to guide you. and It's going to give you the courage to do the mission I'm calling you to do. To the end of Peter's life, this would be the, this would be the same theme that's going on over and over and over. As Peter was arrested in Rome, he was trying to run away because he feared for his life. And as he was running away, he saw a vision of Jesus carrying his cross. And he looked at the vision, he looked at Jesus in this vision, and he says, Lord, where are you going? Quo where are you going? 
And Jesus says, I'm going back to Rome to be crucified again. This gave Peter the courage to go back and to do the mission that Jesus was calling him to, even though it would leave him vulnerable, even though it might cost something. Like I said, Peter to me is a great example, he's a great model, because I'm weak in a lot of ways. I fall short in the ways in which God is calling me a lot of times to to live and to love and to serve and to preach his name. But Peter was too. And if God could use a Povbet fisherman who was bad at his job, if God could use a man who was weak and running even to the last moment and he could make him the, the foundation of the church, then God can use me as well. If God can take the 12 men that he did, half of them fishermen and uneducated, one of them a tax collector, one that would become a traitor, and he could take these 12 men and set the foundation for the church, the world, what could he do with the 200 of us in church today? If we allow him to take control of our life, if we stay close to him and don't leave our faith in the pew today, if as we go forth, we proclaim his message and his word, why? Because none of us are disqualified in doing that. And everyone desire to hear the message. Today, you and I are being called, we're being formed, and we're being sent to go and preach the word that God has given us, to go share the the ways in which God has impacted our life, to go and proclaim the reason why we came to church today. Might be because, you know what, I just ain't been in a long time. Might be because mom asked me to, because it's Mother's Day and I'm supposed to do it. But you and I are called, regardless of our circumstance, to preach the faith, to preach the Word of God, to share how it is that God has impacted my life to everyone we come in contact with. If we remain close to the Lord, we remain where we're listening to what it is that God is saying to us. We listen and we pay attention to how it is that God's moving in our life. I guarantee you this week, God is going to put someone in your life that he wants you to share your faith with. Might be a friend who loses a parent. Might be be somebody at school who's just having a rough day. But I guarantee you, there's someone in your life that the Lord is going to ask you to share the faith with. And if you don't do it, no one will. We're all commissioned to proclaim the faith. None of us are disqualified. And the beautiful part is is that we have a message that everyone wants to hear. No matter if it's a Roman centurion who's trying to stamp out the faith. No matter if it's the kind of socially awkward kid who hangs out himself. No matter if it's that one girl at work that you just can't stand. (laughs) We're not disqualified for sharing the faith. And everyone needs to hear the message.